So let me introduce Professor Monahan to you. Professor Anthony Monahan teaches in the Department of Health and Physical Education here at QCC. He received his bachelor's in health and physical education from University of Rhode Island, a master's in physical education also from University of Rhode Island, and a PhD in education from Rhode Island College. He teaches critical issues in health education, swimming, table tennis, badminton, and volleyball here at QCC. Um, he has traveled quite extensively. He has taught in the Dominican Republic. Brazil. Anyone knows where that is? Yeah. Where? Close to Haiti. Close to Haiti, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Brazil. I know. Uh, Brazil, um, he's been all over the place. And I'm really honored to have him with us. It truly is a privilege for all of us to hear from him. The topic, of course, is empathy. Please join me in welcoming Professor Manahan. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Professor Manahan. The first thing I would like you to do is take out a piece of paper and a pencil or a pen. And take a few moments to uh, write down three things, three things that define you. Three things that define who you are. Three things that define you, as you would define yourself, not as someone else would define yourself. Coming from you. OK, we're all good with that? OK. Thank you. I was thinking of a situation that happened to me a long time ago when I was uh, 19 years old when I was in college and I bought my first car and it was an older car and it needed some repair and I was not very good with making car repairs but when you have a car and you don't have money you try to fix the car by yourself so one of the things that I needed to do was to change the uh, the light the back light in the car wasn't working so I went downstairs to the basement on my, my father's workbench, and he had a little drawer with, filled with different light bulbs. So I grabbed a light. Oh, this was going to fit. And these particular lights in the back of the car, you had to push it in and turn it. OK. So I take the light bulb. I unscrewed the, the thing on my car, and I bent down. And I, all right, pushing it in, pushing it in, pushing it in. Psh and the light bulb burst in my fingers. Oh, no. And all of the shards of glass and the splinters of glass went into my thumb. OK, so I'm standing there like, ah. So what happens? They took me to the hospital. And in the hospital, well, guess what they did? They took a wire brush, and they brushed the shards of glass out of the open wound of my thumb. OK? What happened there? <laughs> what happened there? What happened there with you? You felt your pain. You felt the pain. You felt the pain. How do you feel that pain that happened to me so long ago? So long ago. How did that happen? Well, it happened because of your mirror neurons. We have these things in our brain called mirror neurons. And what they do is they allow us to feel what other people are feeling. OK? So if somebody hurts themselves, they're going to feel pain. But if you observe someone hurting themselves, you're going to feel the pain as well. 
I broke my leg sliding into third base in a baseball game. Broke my leg in three places. I cannot watch anybody in sports if their legs or arms are moving in the wrong way. I can't even look because it goes right through me because I feel it because my mirror neurons are working. What these mirror neurons do is they allow you to experience the emotion of somebody else. This is a biological factor. This is the biological basis for what we call empathy. It allows us to stimulate their feeling and feel that feeling as our own. It allows us to be invested in those people that we observe, those people that we are feeling. It means we are actually wired for empathy, okay? And what is empathy? When you feel like, like somebody else, you feel the, feel the pain of others. others. Okay, feel the pain of others, sure. That's part of it. So what's happening in this picture? The man and the woman are pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> the man feels feel what the wife getting through. Or? Exactly, it's a simulation of this is what it feels like to have of, of somebody inside of you. This is what your body feels like to have this additional weight, to have this additional stuff going on. Not only did the man have that, but also the woman. They are feeling what it feels like. You're assimilating what it's going to feel like. Okay, empathy involves an affective mode. What's affective? What's that word, affective? What does that mean? Affection. Wait, no. The results or whatever you feel. Affection. Somebody said affection. It, it, it means feelings, it means emotion. Whenever we see that word affect, affective, it means dealing with emotions. Okay? So it's our affective mode of understanding. We understand, we understand through feeling, okay, of someone else, and we share that emotion with that other person. You put yourself in another person's shoes. You feel it and you think it. That's what empathy is. Putting yourself in their shoes and understanding what it's like to be them. What I'm gonna do now is gonna show you a video, a short film, it's gonna be 10 minutes long. I want you to just relax. They go very quickly, they explain things very quickly, but what we're gonna do is after the film, I'm gonna take it, break it down and explain to it a little more clearly. So for now, don't try to take notes and write it down, just relax, just watch the video, enjoy the video. Hopefully it will play all the way through. In the last 10 years, there's been some very interesting developments in evolutionary biology, neurocognitive science, child development research, and many other fields, which is beginning to challenge some of these long-held shibboleths that we've had about human nature and the meaning of the human journey. But there is another frame of reference emerging in the sciences, which is quite interesting. It really challenges these assumptions. And with that, the institutions that we have created based on those assumptions, our educational institutions, our business practices, our governing institutions, etc. Let me take you back to the early 1990s. Sleepy little laboratory in Parma, Italy, and scientists had a MRI brain scanning machine on a macaque monkey as the macaque monkey was trying to open up a nut. They wanted to see how the neurons would light up. So the monkey's trying to open up the nut, the neurons light up. And just by serendipity, and this is how science sometimes happens, a human being walked into the laboratory, I don't know if it was by mistake, and he was hungry, he saw the nuts and opened up one of the nuts and tried to crack it open. The macaque monkey was totally shocked because who was this invader in his laboratory? And he didn't move. He just gazed at this human trying to open up the nut, just like he had done a few seconds earlier. And then the scientist looked on the MRI brain scanner. The same exact neurons were lighting up when he observed the human being opening the nut as when the monkey opened the nut. And the scientists had not a clue as to what this was. They thought the MRI machine had broken. They then began to put MRI brain scanning machines on other primates, especially chimpanzees with our big 
big neocortex. Then they went to humans. And what they found over and over again is something called mirror neurons. And that is that we are apparently soft-wired, some of the primates, all humans. We suspect elephants. We're not sure about dolphins and dogs. We've just begun. But all humans are soft-wired with mirror neurons so that if I'm observing you, your anger, your frustration, your sense of rejection, your joy, whatever it is, and I, I can feel what you're doing, the same neurons will light up in me as if I'm having that experience myself. Now, this isn't all that unusual. We know if a spider goes up someone's arm and I'm observing it going up your arm, I'm going to get a creepy feeling. We take this for granted, but we are actually soft-wired to actually experience another's plight as if we are experiencing ourselves. But mirror neurons are just the beginning of a whole range of research going on in neuropsychology and brain research and in child development that suggests that we are actually soft-wired not for aggression and violence and self-interest and utilitarianism, that we are actually soft-wired for sociability, attachment, as John Bowlby might have said, affection, companionship, and that the first drive is the drive to actually belong. It's an empathic drive. What is empathy? It's very complicated. When little babies in a nursery and one baby cries, the other babies will cry in response. They just don't know why. That's empathic distress. It's built into their biology. Around two and a half years of age, a child actually can begin to recognize himself in a mirror. That's when you begin to mature empathy as a cultural phenomenon. And that is once a, ba a toddler can identify themselves, then they know that if they're observing someone else have a feeling, they know that if they feel something, it's, it's because they're feeling it because someone else has it. They're two separate beings. Selfhood goes together with empathic development. Increasing selfhood, increasing empathic development. Around eight years of age, a child learns about birth and death. They learn where they came from, that they have a one and only life, that life is fragile and vulnerable, and one day they're going to die. That's the beginning of an existential trip. Because when a child learns about birth and death and they have a one and only life, they realize how fragile and vulnerable life is. It's very tough being alive on this planet, whether you're a human being or a fox navigating the forest. So when a child learns that life is vulnerable and fragile and that every moment is precious and that they have their own unique history, it allows the child then to experience another's plight in the same way, that that other person or other being, could be another creature, has a one and only life, it's tough to be alive, and the odds are not always good. So if you think about the times that we've empathized with each other or fellow creatures, it's always because we felt their struggle. We have the width of death and empathy and the celebration of life. And we show solidarity with our compassion. Empathy is the opposite of utopia. There is no empathy in heaven. I guarantee you, I'll tell you before you get there. There isn't any empathy in heaven because there's no mortality. There's no empathy in utopia because there is no suffering. Empathy is grounded in the acknowledgement of death and the celebration of life and rooting for each other to flourish and be. It's based on our frailties and our imperfections. So when we talk about building an empathic civilization, we're not talking about utopia. We're talking about the ability of human beings to show solidarity, not only with each other, but our fellow creatures who have a one and only life on this little planet. We are homo empathicus. So here's the question. We know that consciousness changes in history. The way our brain is wired today is not the way a medieval serf's brain would be wired, and that their brain wouldn't be the same as the wiring of a forager hunter 30,000 years ago. So the question I asked at the beginning of this study six years ago is, how does consciousness change in history? Because I wanted to imagine the following proposition. Is it possible that we human beings who are soft-wired for empathic distress, is it possible we could actually extend our empathy to the entire human race as an extended family and to our fellow creatures as part of our evolutionary family and to the biosphere as our common community? If it's possible to imagine that, then we may be able to save our species and save our planet. And when I say to you tonight, if it's impossible to even imagine that, I don't see how we're going to make it. Empathy is the invisible hand. Empathy is what allows us to stretch our sensibility with another so that we can cohere in larger social units. To empathize is to civilize. To civilize is to empathize. With forage or hunter societies, communication only extended to the local tribe, and shouting distance. Everyone over in the next mountain was the alien other. So empathy only extended to blood ties. When we went to the great hydraulic agricultural civilization, script allowed us to extend the central nervous system and to annihilate more time and space and bring more people together. 
And the differentiation of skills and the increasing selfhood not only led to theological consciousness, but empathy now extended to a new fiction. And that is, instead of just associating with one's blood ties, we detribalized and began association based on religious ties. So a new fiction, Jews start to see all other Jews as extended family and empathize with Jews. Christians start to see all other Christians as extended family and empathize with Christians. Muslims, the same. When we get to the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution, and we extend markets now to larger areas and create a fiction called the nation state. And all of a sudden, the Brits start to see others in, in Britain as extended family. The Germans start to see Germans as extended family. The Americans as Americans. There was no such thing as Germany. There was no such thing as France. These are fictions. But they allow us to extend our family so that we can have loyalties and identities based on the new complex energy communication revolutions we have that annihilate time and space. But if we have gone from empathy in blood ties to empathy in, in religious associational ties to empathy based on national identification, is it really a big stretch to imagine the new technologies allowing us to connect our empathy to the human race writ large in a single biosphere? And what reason would we stop here at the nation state identity and only have ideological empathy or theological based empathy or tribal based blood tie empathy? We have the technology that allows us to extend the central nervous system and to think viscerally as a family, not just intellectually. When that earthquake hit Haiti and then Chile, but especially Haiti, within an hour the Twitters came out and within two hours some cell phone videos, YouTube, and within three hours the entire human race was in an empathic embrace coming to the aid of Haiti. If we were, as the Enlightenment philosophers suggested, in materialistic, self-interested, utilitarian, pleasure-seeking, it couldn't account for the response to Haiti. Apparently, 175,000 years ago in the Rift Valley of Africa, there were about 10,000 anatomically modern human beings walking the grasslands, our ancestors. The geneticists located one database woman. It's a data baseline. Apparently, her genes passed to everyone in this room tonight. The other ladies didn't make it. Gets even more strange. They, they located a single male. This is a data baseline for genetics. They call him the Y chromosome Adam. Apparently, a fairly potent guy. His genes passed to everyone in this room. So here's the news. 6.8 billion people at various stages of consciousness, theological, ideological, psychological, dramaturgical, we're all fighting with each other with different ideas about the world. And guess what? We all came from two people. The Bible got this one right. We could have come from many. But the point is we have to begin thinking as an extended family. We have to broaden our sense of identity. We don't lose the old identities of nationhood and our religious identities, and even our blood ties. But we extend our identity so we can think of the human race as our fellow sojourners and our other creatures here as part of our evolutionary family and the biosphere as our community. We have to rethink the human narrative. If we are truly homo empathicus, then we need to bring out that core nature because if it doesn't come out and it's repressed by our parenting, our educational system, our business practice and government, the secondary drives come, the narcissism, the materialism, the violence, the aggression. If we can have a global debate, let it start here from the British Royal Society for the Arts, which apparently you're doing, to begin rethinking human nature, to bring out our empathic sociability so that we can rethink the institutions of society and prepare the groundwork for an empathic civilization. They went very quickly. Uh, and uh, we'll explain it. There's a little shakiness on there as well. Okay, what he says is this. Um, this is what he means. Because we have these mirror neurons, what he's saying is we're, we're all connected. We're all connected through this ability to feel each other. And what he considers is he considers the world from the bottom of the, of the ocean to up in the sky as one living organism and that we're all connected. Not only are we connected to each other, but we're connected to all the other living things in the world. And these mirror neurons are the key to our connections. So what he's saying is that was the invisible hand, is, is using these mirror neurons, using this empathy to understand each other, and we are not built to be aggressive. 
We're not built to be competitive. We're not built to fight each other. We're actually built to help each other out and belong with each other and cooperate with each other. We're actually biologically wired for cooperation. If we did not have that, we would not have survived as a human race. If we did not have that, that ability, there's no way that we would have survived if we were all independent people doing our own thing. Okay? Simple enough? Okay? Any other questions on that? So that's basically his, his thing. He's saying because we have this, this ability, this empathy, uh, it allows us to cooperate and, and be together. And what he's also saying is we all pretty much came from two people. We're all an extended family. So we shouldn't have all these divisions and these uh, issues with nations and politics and so forth. This unequal society. Uh, what do we got here? Yeah. All right. So uh, what I'm going to go through is I'm going to go through some of this, uh, the developmental levels of empathy. Now, we all have the capacity for empathy. We all have most normal brains have these mirror neurons. So we're all wired to be able to understand other people's feelings. But that does not necessarily mean we're going to help these other people. Okay? So the basic, basic level of empathy is called global empathy. And we, we see this with babies. Now baby, even though baby might be fed, changed, comfortable, rested, a baby's going to cry if other babies in the room are crying. Why? Because they're feeling distress from these other babies. So that's when we got this from that family. Why are we crying? I don't know. We're crying because we feel their distress. So global empathy is that basic feeling that we all have. Now what I say about developmental empathy is we all have it, but it doesn't mean we're developing it further. Empathy is like a skill. Some people have more than others. It's an ability. It's like an athletic skill or a musical skill, okay? Uh, where some people are more athletic, some people are more musical, some people are more artistic, some people are better with languages. We have it. The good thing about it is we can develop it further. With practice, we can make it better. So developmental empathy, even though we start off at this basic level, we can make it better. We can increase this, uh, this skill. And Higher empathy leads to morals. What are morals? It's like knowing the difference between good and bad, okay, right and wrong, those kind of things. So higher empathy leads to higher morals. I'm going to show you a little film here about uh, a study that was done in uh, New Haven, Connecticut at Yale University about babies and empathy. This is very interesting. Let's see if I can do this without messing it up here. Scientists Karen Wynn and Paul Bloom of Yale University believe that moral code may be written into us at birth. That is a lot of duck you're fitting in your mouth. I've been studying babies now for just a little over 20 years. The more that I see of them, the more complex they become. There is a lot going on in there, and it's far more rich and complex of a mental life than, than we had ever thought. By studying babies, you get to see humans before they're contaminated by culture, by television, by a lot of social interactions, by sex and romance. You get to see humans in some sense in their purest form. And then you could ask, what's our natures? Are we, are we kind? Are we cruel? Are we uh, morally intelligent? Can we tell good from evil? And the work I'm doing here with my colleagues suggests that, that very early on, there's some fundamental moral sense, some moral instinct that's present in all of us. How do you pose moral questions to a baby? Karen devised a kind of morality play for babies to watch and judge. We show babies a little puppet show in which this one puppet is trying to open a box and he's trying and he's trying and he just can't quite get it on its own. And another puppet comes along and grabs the other side of the box lid and helps him open it. 
They then see the little puppet, he's trying again to open the box, and a different puppet comes along and jumps on top of the box lid, slams it shut. Oh. And so our question to the babies is, babies, do you have any different feelings towards these two characters, towards the one who helped in a nice fashion open the box, and towards this other who just really quite rudely slams it down and foils this guy's attempts to get into the box? Which one do you like? And we find that very reliably, babies, um, even as young as five and six months of age, will reach towards and reach for the helpful puppet. That one, okay, <laughs> good job. Layla has chosen the good puppy. Between 80 and 95% of babies do. Paul and Karen believe this is a sign that babies are drawn towards kindness and away from antisocial behavior. But if Okay, so, that's pretty cool, huh? <laughs> so this shows that even when we are very young, infants can tell the difference between right and wrong and are gravitated towards those people that are helping, okay? Even when they say this is before we're contaminated with our culture, with the television, with all of those things around us that vie for our emotional attention, that babies have this built into them, this moral code, and then they would prefer the helpful puppet than the one that's disruptive. Questions on that? Comments, opinions, questions, Klaus? Mina, you do? Okay, so that's a basic uh, global empathy. A little higher up on the scale is called uh, egocentrical empathy. And uh, the reason why I put this picture here is because uh, when I, my daughter was younger, she was like uh, six or seven years old, and we were watching TV. As soon as they put the channel, uh, one of them had a commercial with uh, starving children in Africa, she saw and she said, quick, 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 turn the channel, turn the channel. Okay? Because egocentrical empathy is, you start to understand the feelings of other people, but you don't want to go there. You don't want to go there, okay? You don't want to leave your own comfort of your own self. Now, it's important to realize that young children are egocentrical. They have to be egocentrical. The younger the child, more they need, okay? Children are naturally me first. That's the way it's supposed to be. They're supposed to be me first because they need more. Okay, so egocentrical empathy is when a child can get it, they see it, but they don't ever want to go there. Turn away, I don't want to think about it. Okay, I don't have to think about it, it's not me. Okay, so egocentrical empathy is very natural. It's the next stage up where we start to recognize who we are, and we also recognize, and when we recognize who we are, we're recognizing who other people are in relation to us as well. But as far as experiencing something like this, the young child is not going to want to be able to put themselves into that position. It's too scary, it's, not, it's too foreign, it's too different. So children won't do that. Okay? However, something very interesting, a new study came out a couple years ago, saying that wealthy people, the ultra-rich, the super-rich, especially those people who are born wealthy, have really difficulty understanding and reading other people's emotions. Wealthy people don't fully understand other people's emotions. Why do you think that? Because they got more money. Because they got more money? Does that... No, they, they, they don't want to feel the pain. They don't... We don't care about the, the poor and the, and the um. Perhaps. Because they never they struggled. They never go through. They, they never through. struggled. Because they never struggled. They never, went to, they never went to the laundromat, never went on a city bus, never had to worry about paying the rent. They never saw people mm -hmm. suffering. Okay. To be in the same situation. Yeah, well, maybe they are afraid to be in the same situation. Fear is one of those things that suppresses empathy. Okay, what else? Do we have questions up here? Uh, I was going to say because they 
<clears throat> never have an idea of how other people struggle because they have it so easy. Right. Remember, when we said that empathy is developmental, you have to develop it. So maybe, and they don't, they don't, this study doesn't show the reasons why they have less capacity to read. It just shows that, the study shows that these rich people don't understand other people's feelings as much as middle class people and poor people. But perhaps you're right. Perhaps that they've never had to deal with it. They don't have to deal with it. I don't they care. Probably, never have to deal with it. probably don't never, will never have to deal with it. I have my money. Why do I have to worry about those people? Perhaps. Any other comments on that? So anyway, because because of this whole situation that they're not really fully able to put themselves in other people's shoes, I kind of consider that egocentrical empathy as well. So pretty much you can kind of say, or I'm kind of saying, that super rich people that have a hard time understanding other people's compassion are pretty much like little children not getting empathy and understanding it to a point but not wanting to be there or not having to be there. I don't even want to deal with it. I have my money, why should I care? Okay? It makes you wonder why we have so many rich people running things and becoming politicians and things like that. You know, it's kind of a scary thought. Any other comments on that? I just want to ask, as a parent, where do you go wrong in order for your child to grow up without empathy, you having that empathy? Oh, we're going to get to that. You are going to go all over that, okay? Yes, we're going to we're going to we're going to spell that out. Okay? We're going to see what 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 changes empathy, what suppresses empathy, and we're all going to see what also adds empathy, uh, augments empathy and improves it, okay? Good question. So the next level up is what most people are at. This is called situational empathy. People are uh, fully uh, able to put themselves in other people's shoes, however, it's a situational thing. Okay, like the film said, first we have empathy for the people that we know, people that are close to us, people that are like us. We have empathy for our family members. First and foremost, because they're our family. Okay, when they uh, had the closing of the highway the other day, oh. I texted my, my cousin, because I know that he's going to be traveling on that highway. I texted him that the highway's closed. I thought of my cousin. I thought of my family first. Okay? I know why the highway's closed because of the shooting right. in, in, in my neighborhood. Correct. In Queens. Yeah, right. He right. killed two people. Yeah. Horrible story. So when we have this situational empathy, it means we have empathy, but it's not for everybody. It's for people like me or people that I understand. So we have things like family, things like religion. I have empathy for people of my religion. We are all the same. I have more empathy for them than other people's religion. Empathy for nationalism. I have empathy for people in my country as opposed to people in other countries. Empathy for gender. Okay, the girls stick together, the guys stick together, that kind of thing. Also for a political affiliation. Okay, and of course, sport teams, you know, the Red Sox fans versus the Yankee fans, the Mets fans versus the Cubs fans, and so forth. We have empathy for some people that are like us. Now, that could be a good thing, and it also could be a bad thing. Why can it be a bad thing? Because we can't hate each other. Why? Why do we hate each other? Because, yeah, it promotes competition, and competition suppresses empathy. Yes. Uh, uh, in this situation, the scope of the empathy is not uh, wider, like not a global wise. If uh, American people to think about their own nationality, their own, their own community, it is uh, the scope of limited on this. Uh, only in, uh, up to the America, they, they, it can spread over the world. So right. So situational empathy means you can narrow that empathy towards this particular viewpoint. Okay. You can turn that empathy uh, towards a certain type of people. You can watch a certain television so that will make you think in certain ways. So you can take, empathy can be shaped, it can be molded, okay? 
it, even though you have empathy, we're going to make you have empathy for this kind of people. Or we're going to make you have empathy for my political party. Or we're going to make you have empathy for poor people or rich people or middle class people. All these things can be shaped in you. Most of us are on this kind of level. We love Yankee fans, but we hate Boston fans, okay? <laughs> you know, that may or may not cause us to do violent things, but at the same time, we turn in one off and we're, as we're turning the other. So situational empathy is, yes, it is the next step in development, but it also can be dangerous because it also can be shaped. It can be twisted, it can be narrowed, it can be suppressed, it can be stunted and blunted, okay? We can turn off empathy. They do it in football. Don't look at the, your opponent's face, don't know their name, just know their number. You don't want to look at them, you don't want to think about them, you don't want to feel about them, you just have to beat them. All right, that's more of perspective taking. We are taking the perspective of other people, okay? so. Situational empathy is, it's there. Most of us are here. And the thing about it is, and what we said is, empathy, these mirror neurons are in us all, but they're not equally distributed. Some people have more than others, just like I said, athletic ability, artistic ability, some have more than others. And the reason that is, is we have neural pathways in our brain, consider them like canals or rivers, on a, uh, rivers of water. And if my river is wide, I can fit many boats and many things. But if your river is small, you can only fit one at a time. So all of these things are vying for our attention, our emotional attention. So sometimes some people can only choose one thing at a time to feel for, okay? But again, like we said, we can improve the empathy. We can develop it further. So now we have what we call transformational empathy. And this is what they were talking about in the film a little bit, where you are able to empathize with other people, people that are completely different than you. Okay, transformational empathy is what we're talking about in this article that's called muscular empathy. Okay, where it's based in curiosity, it allows you to put yourself in other people's shoes with leaving yourself behind. It's a higher edge empathy, higher order empathy. It involves the feeling, the emotion, but it also involves the thinking. So not only am I feeling what this person's feeling, I am understanding their situation as well. Now the key to transformational empathy is that when you become empathetic for somebody else, you leave yourself behind. Here's the definition that I like. An affective, we all remember that word, affective. Affective response, more appropriate to someone's other, someone else's situation than your own. Okay, so I teach uh, physical education and I teach, uh, I would teach students who want to become phys ed teachers. Who becomes phys ed teachers? Um, gym people. Yeah, right. Gym people, athletic people, people that are good at sports, they become phys ed teachers. But when they become teachers, not all of their students are gonna be phys ed people, gym people, they're all, they're, most of their class is gonna be clumsy people. <laughs> Only about 10% of their students are gonna be athletic people. So one of my, the job for me is to get them to understand what it's like to be awkward, what it's like to be clumsy, what it's like to fail in physical skills. Because in order to be a good teacher in that field, you have to have an emotional response more appropriate to someone else than yourself. For these people, it's easy. Sports is easy. But for others, it might not be easy. So we have to have empathy. And not only do we have to have empathy, but we have to leave our own self behind to put ourselves in other people's shoes. Everybody understand that? So those are the, yes, question. But it can be bad also because about vengeance, and if I got my family, somebody killed them, but because I feel empathy for my, 
for example, for my cousin or my sister, somebody kill her, and I said, oh, this that this is affecting me. So I want to 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 do something. Like, do you think this is an empathy? Yeah. That's a good question. Uh, yeah. Uh, of course, we can, we can turn off empathy, okay? We can turn it off, all right? My sister works in uh, the um, intensive care unit of a hospital. She treats babies that are dying of cancer and various things. If she felt emotion for all of her patients, she would not be able to do her job. <laughs> you have to be able to turn it off. So we can control it to some point. But as for your example, if someone comes in here and shoots your, 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 someone in your family, of course it's gonna upset you very much because of someone that you love. However, someone asked, asked a, a similar question last class. If somebody came in here and shot one of the students and then the police came and beat, beat up the person, would we have empathy for the person that killed who was getting beat up? Yeah, and my answer would be, yeah, we would. We would feel that. Because one thing is we don't know what the situation is what that caused that person to do a crime, okay? And I use an example of a murderer who climbed a tower in Texas and shot a bunch of people with a rifle. And then he shot himself, but he wrote a suicide note saying, please give me an autopsy, autopsy me. And what they found was that he had a brain tumor in his brain that was preventing him from uh, all the good thoughts and all the aggression was going through without the filter. So he had some kind of uh, medical issue that was causing him to feel violent and he ended up, so uh, he had, there was a reason why. And there's a reason why people do things like that as well. There's always a reason why somebody commits one of these crimes. So yeah, you're not gonna feel very happy for this guy, but at the same time, uh, and you can turn it off too. But at the same time, you probably feel some empathy if he's experienced harm as well. It depends on this, in this situation though. Can I be my family first? Absolutely, of course. And, that, and, and everyone would say that. Everyone would say that. Okay, but as far as situational empathy is concerned, how about this? We talk a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot about the, the Trade Center, the World, World, the Trade Center, the towers, okay? My cousin was in those towers, okay? He was there on the 70th floor, all right? He barely got out alive, he, he lived. But we talk about those 3,000 people all the time. How much do we talk about all the thousands of people that have been killed in the Middle East since then? Do we talk about all the people that got killed in Iraq and Afghanistan as a result of the 3,000 people? Okay, so that's the situation. We think about the situation of our people got killed. We don't even think about that. We don't even think about that. But way, way more people got killed over there, okay? So we're not able to completely transform ourselves and be our, in that place, in that situation where other people are losing their families, other people are losing their homes, other people are being killed, okay? So we are, we're situational a lot of the time. But this is like a higher way where you can actually take yourself and put yourself in other people's shoes that are completely different than you, including someone that's a murderer, okay? Now, higher levels of empathy also lead to morals. What are morals? Good and bad, good and bad, like we said before, okay? So the higher the empathy, the more that you will have higher morals as well. Higher levels of empathy also lead to what we call altruism. Does anyone know that word? What? Altruism. Altruism is helping behavior. If you're helping someone, then you're being altruistic. So having higher levels of empathy means that you're going to help people more too. Yeah. Do you think that they um, find lower levels of empathy in parents that neglect their kids? Probably. Depending on the situation. Okay. Remember, empathy has to develop. It doesn't come natural that we're all going to be super empathetic people. Do you think if we see the, for example, if we see the drama, like, like you explaining what happened to Wall Street Center, 
we see it, we feel more empathy than when we don't see the scene, they just explain to us what happened? That's a really good question. Um, there are things that can kind of suppress our empathy. For example, uh, when we're driving in our cars, we'll think nothing to yelling and screaming at someone that cuts us off. But if we were standing in line and it was people to people, we probably wouldn't say those nasty things, would we? But we would say it from cars because we're being protected by steel and glass, and it kind of shields our. Just because you give somebody the middle finger and they cut you off, they still can chase you down. Oh sure, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh sure, but if some, but if you're waiting in line for some food over the food court and someone cuts you off, are you going to stick your middle finger in their face? No. Probably not, because <laughs> because of those mirror neurons. So there are barriers that kind of, uh, you know, kind of blunt that. And yeah, you have probably are going to have more of a reaction if you're right there as opposed to listening to someone's story. But you still feel it. When I told you the story of the light bulb bursting in my hand, you all were doing this. You were feeling it. You weren't there. You weren't there, but you felt it nonetheless. Okay? So it still works, but at different levels. Do you know how to change the light bulb now? I will tell you this, well, this is what I learned. <laughs> when you buy a light bulb, a car light bulb in a store, it will says right on the box, do not touch it with your fingers. Oh, okay. You don't put your bare skin on a light bulb, yes I do. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Can too much empathy be a weakness? Can too much empathy be a weakness? <laughs> well, no, I don't think so. But what, you know, it could lead you to be vulnerable, okay, but empathy also comes with knowledge. Okay, so uh, I think that's two different things, empathy and vulnerability. Like I have empathy for you and then, yeah, come into my house and live with me and then next thing you know, the person takes over. Okay. That could happen, I guess. <laughs> yeah. If a soldier, uh, like uh, for a soldier, for the empathy means like uh, for a soldier for, uh, like, uh, for any kind of person, if it, like, uh, how does a soldier feel like a for empathy? Okay. In favor of the, uh, the, crime, the, criminal? The, first thing that, the first thing you do when you join the military is you go to a boot camp. And what that boot camp does, it takes away your empathy. It makes you think in these terms that you are, you know, this person, you are defending the world. You don't think, you just follow orders. So you're, they, turn, they don't want you to think, they don't want you to feel. They just want you to follow orders and they make it like this is a code, we have to protect each other, we have to defend our country. So there is no thinking and feeling. Uh, in the ideal soldier, there's no thinking and feeling. And that's one of the first things that they do when you're in the military, is take away that empathy because that empathy could get them killed. That's their rationale. If you have empathy, if you have feeling for these people, you're going to die because you know, you're not going to do your job. Your job is not to think, it's just to follow these orders. So yeah, that's what they do. That's what they do. They scrub that empathy away. You know, hopefully you can get it back. But what happened those who marry? Those what? No, because if you don't have this empathy, why are you going to marry for? Because you're not going to feel what I feel, you know? Marry What's it going to matter? Why is no, it going to matter? About, he said about the military people. Yeah. Oh. Now, what I said is this situational, when we have that situational empathy mm -hmm. in the slide before, where you can the empathy in you, that natural empathy in you, can be directed, can be sharpened, can be blunted, can be cut off, can be suppressed. That's what they do. That's what they do. In fact, they do it out of necessity. Because in order for them to survive as a unit, as a platoon, they have to just follow their orders and do that stuff. Because if they started to think on their own and feel on their own, you know, people can be in danger. Okay? Not, you know, not that you agree or disagree, that's just the way it is. All right? Okay, so we gave everyone a, a, a poem called The Trees. <clears throat> a poem. And uh, what do you think? Let's, let's, let's read this. Who, who would like to read the first uh, stanza? Sure. If you could just, you don't have to stand, if you could just speak up. 
There is unrest in the forest, there is trouble in the trees. The trees for the maples want more sunlight, and the oaks ignore the trees. Okay, so the maples want more sunlight, and the oaks ignore their pleas. What are they talking about? I have no idea. Yeah. Um, the forest isn't doing too good. Okay. And why? They want more sunlight. They want some more sunlight. And why don't they have more sunlight? Because they eat the oaks in Norway. And who are the oaks? Who are the oaks? The oaks have what the maples want. What does that make them? The, the oaks are the rich people and the rich people. Ah, okay. The oaks could be the rich people. They're the haves. And the maples are the have-nots because they are looking for more light that the oaks have. Okay, the next stanza, please. Somebody? Someone else? Read? Go ahead. The trouble with the maples and they apply convicted with their right. They say the oaks are just too lofty and they grab up all the light. But the oaks can help their feelings if they like the way they are made. And they wonder why the maples can be happy in this shape. Okay, so the trouble with the maples, and they are quite convinced they are right. They say the oaks are just too lofty. What is lofty? Too soft. Well, it's not soft. What is lofty? Huh? Ritzy. Okay. Lofty is self-important, above everyone else. It's a word for tall, but it's, yeah. I'm not only tall, but I am, you know, very good at flashy tall and so forth. And they grab up all the light. So what, is they, what are they calling the oaks? Greedy. 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 Okay. But the oaks can't help their feelings if they like the way they're made. What is that? What does that mean? What kind of empathy do they have? <laughs> we saw it in a couple slides back. <laughs> What do you think? Egocentric. 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 Yeah. Hey, I can't help the way I'm made. I can't help if I'm a rich guy. Oh, right? Mm -hmm. Can't they just be happy in their shade? Doesn't that sound like the whole study with the rich people where they don't understand the compassion under the feelings of other people? Mm -hmm. It's the same kind of thing, right? Well, the Oaks are saying, hey, we like the way we're made. What's wrong with us? Can't they just be happy being underneath us? Below us? Okay. Continue. Someone else? Go ahead. There is trouble in the forest and all the <coughs> creatures um, and all the creatures have play. As the maple scream oppression and the oaks just shake their heads. Okay, what is oppression? When you put things down. When you put things down, when people are put down. Okay, what are some examples of oppression? Cuba, perhaps, yeah. Germany. Nazi Germany. Well, who's oppressed in Nazi Germany? Jews. The Jews. Other examples of oppression. How about in our country? Slavery. slavery. Okay. So slavery is oppression, where you are in a situation that you are being held down, you are being prevented from advancing, you are being prevented to from progressing. Okay. So the oaks and maples are screaming oppression, and the oaks are just shaking their head. All right, the next, the next line, please. Go ahead. So the maples formed a union and demanded equal rights. These oaks are just too greedy. We will make them give us light. Now there's no more oak oppression, for they passed the noble law, and the trees are all kept equal by hatchet, axe, and saw. All right. So what do you think happened there? No. They become people. They become people. 
They start feeling the pain. They start together. They form a union. Okay, so, they, so the maples got together. They said, all right, we're going to help each other out. We're going to support each other because we need more light and the oaks aren't giving us the light. So the, so the maples started to get together and to fight for their rights. But what happened at the end? They all suffered. Why do they all suffer? Right. Because they did not compromise at all. We had one part saying, all right, we don't care what you say. The other part said, we need some more light. So we don't care. This is what happens a lot. We got two, two people, two groups, two political parties fighting, fighting, fighting. No one compromises. The rest of us all suffer. Okay? We need to compromise. We all need to get along. In that film is saying, we are built to compromise, we're built to cooperate, we need to get along, we all come from the same family. If we don't do that, that's the destruction of our civilization, it's the destruction of our world. Okay? Any questions on that poem? Does it make sense? Yes. Okay. It can be trees, but you can make it as a metaphor for other things, like people as you just did. Good, good, good. So let's get into this article a little bit. <coughs> a muscular empathy, Tanishi Coates. What made this, what made him write this article? He writes about it right at the beginning. What makes him write this article? Black, I guess. I don't know. What, what, what caused him to, to write? He writes it right at the beginning why he wrote this article. He was, when he was living in uh, this neighborhood. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. All right, right, okay, yes. Somebody wrote a blog saying that if, even though he's not a poor black kid in Philadelphia, he realizes how things are tough, but if he was in the poor school, what would he do? He would rise above, he would study hard, he'd make sure he got the best grades. Even if he's in the worst school, he was going to get the best grades. This way he's going to progress. What's wrong with that statement? You don't, you don't have to explain, you never experienced this. Before. Exactly. Okay, what kind of empathy is that? Situation. Situational empathy. Okay, where he's taking his own situation and projecting it into the other place. Without leaving himself behind, he took him whole self, his whole self, his whole successful self, and he put himself in that poor school and said, oh yeah, I'm going to do great. Okay? I mean, I can say that too. I got a PhD. But if I don't leave myself behind, there's no way I can do that, okay? So he's responding to a blog of a man who was writing saying, if I was a poor black kid, I would make sure that I got good grades and blah, 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 okay? You know, I want my daughter to get good grades. I know she studies all the time, but she did, she's not really that great in math, and she struggles and stuff too. And I'm going to say, well, if I were you, I'd study math more. <laughs> She's working, she's trying, we all have our own issues, we all have our own situations. Okay, so he writes about this, he starts responding to this blog, and then he starts talking about when he was in college and they talked about what? Us. About what? Oh, that was at the beginning. But what is he talking about in the middle of this article? Yes, who said it? Slavery. slavery. He's talking about when he was col in college, he's taking these classes and they're studying slavery, how these students were saying, well, if I was a slave, I'd just revolt or I wouldn't be able to handle being a slave. I'd just run away, I'd take off. What, what's wrong with that 
What's wrong with that vision? It wasn't that easy. It's not that easy. Why isn't that easy? Because they were prepared for stuff like that. Right. Because they are oppressed. And when you're oppressed, you don't know anything beyond your oppression. You have no control. You have no control. You can't think beyond your plantation, your slave, your slaves. So what do you have there? <clears throat> what do you have there? Because they weren't together, because if they would be together, there would be more people than just the owner. Right. But all they have is their families, right? The little house that they live in, that's all they have in the world. Who's going to run away from the only people that you love in the world? It's hard to think beyond your situation. So for someone to say, well, if I was a slave, I would, you know, I don't think any of us could say that. If we truly have empathy for someone in slavery, we got to leave ourselves behind and understand that not only are you oppressed, but all of the things that you know, all the things that you have, are right there. Okay? A lot of times we have oppression that people don't even know that they're oppressed. There's oppression all over us, all around us. Okay? Most people defend their oppression. Okay? So, in that situation, he's responding. So how does he end up creating this thing called muscular empathy? How does he resolve this whole article? How does he come up with this muscular empathy? What does he talk about? You say like, um, that if he was a nation, he'd probably do the same thing, like the slavery. He says like, if, he, if black people, if they give black people votes, then he'd probably, probably do the same thing too. Right. In other words, he's saying that you, you are not, you know, when you tend to project yourself into another situation without leaving yourself behind, you tend to become like a super guy, a superman. And what he says is a muscular empathy rooted in curiosity. If you really want to understand slave, slave masters, poor black kids, poor white kids, rich people of colors, whoever it is, Essential that you first come to grips with disturbing facts of your own mediocrity. We're all just regular people. We're not Superman, we're going to transform ourselves and free all the slaves. We're just regular people. And then they are regular people. To have empathy for someone else is to understand that they're regular people as well as we are. Okay? It's all fine and good. You declare that you would free the slaves. But it's much more interesting to assume that you wouldn't and have asked the question, why? Why wouldn't you free the slaves? What do you think? Why wouldn't you free the slaves? Because they would have to pay them if they were free them. Oh, I don't know if they would have to pay them or not. They're slaves, don't they? Don't get paid. They lose the power. They feed them. They lose the power. Yeah, if you are in that situation, you will not have the same power as you have now. You can't project yourself as you are now into their situation. Okay, so how does he wrap this all up? How does he deal with this person's blog? How does he finish this whole article? What is he talking, who is he talking about at the end? Yeah, who's that poor kid from West Philly? Who's the poor kid from West Philly? No, he's not the poor kid from West Philly. Who's the poor kid from West Philly? When he was six, he came home from school and found his entire life out on the sidewalk. Eviction. He spent the next couple of weeks living in a truck with his father, his aunt, his brother. Every day they'd search trash for scraps and take to the yard for money. His father abused everyone in the family. He saw a little of his father alive. He died when he was nine. At 17, he convinced he would die if he stayed in Philly. He dropped out of school and lied his way into a war. Who was he talking about? I don't know. 
He's not talking about himself. Who's he talking about? Read, 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 read on. His father. So he's talking about his father. Okay? His father is the person who experienced hardship as a child. His father is the poor kid who had to live in a truck. Okay? The author, who's the baby, and that's a picture of his father, he's relating that, that experience, even though this happened before he was even alive. You know that your memories extend beyond your life. I have memories of my grandfather, stories he told me when he was a child. Those stories are part of me. They're part of my memory, even though they happened way before I was born. Okay, so Tanishi Coates is telling the stories of his father, things that happened before he was even born. And they are part of him. It makes him, partly makes him who he is. He's relating that even though I didn't experience that stuff, I didn't experience this hardship on the street. Somebody close to me, my father, experienced it. He has empathy for that. So he's talking about muscular empathy, being able to put yourself in those other people's shoes. Okay? Any other questions about this article? Now, was some vocabulary words that were a little difficult, but basically it's a response to somebody's situational empathy by saying, look, you have to have that higher empathy. You gotta transform yourself into their situation. And then at the end, revealing his own father's situation, which wasn't his own, which which became his own. Okay? Yes. Who's talking? Okay, sorry. Um, how can someone be a divorce uh, public school from the speech in the article? How can somebody what? Um, from the speech in the article, um, you're talking about like um, people um, people's worst uh, public school and then how can someone be in the worst public school and be well, what he's saying is even if I'm in the worst school, I'm going to study hard to become the top student of the worst school. I know it's hard to imagine, but this is what like this, this man who wrote in his blog was projecting himself, even though he wasn't a poor black kid, he was projecting himself to say, I'm going to save the day, I'm going to free the slaves and so forth. Okay. Tanisha Coates was responding to that, saying, look, it's not that simple, it's not that easy to just say that you're going to be a superhero if you go back in time and become slaves or if you go to this particular school. What he's saying is we really need to understand deeply what, these other, what people are experiencing. And you have to take, remove yourself from your own self to become understanding of that situation. Okay? Um, do you believe someone can... Everyone in this country uh, can have a chance to be successful. I do. And I believe this is a place where that happens. This place, the most diverse campus in the nation, is your opportunity to excel. This is a place where dreams come true. This is a college. You come here to study and to become a professional person. You become a professional person, then you're going to only be, you're going to have financial security, you're going to have a status, you're going to be able to make decisions. And this is what we do here. And everyone, you know, not everybody makes it. But this is the opportunity that you have right here. And this is why I'm proud to be here. Okay? All right. So a quick review here, a quick review. So empathy is inherent in all of us. We all have this capacity. It's all, it's all part of our biology. It starts out as an emotional recognition. We recognize the emotions of other people, okay? We recognize their feelings, okay? But we have all these forces, cultural forces and political forces and television and so forth that are trying to get our emotional attention, okay? And because we don't all have the same amount of empathy, that uh, some of us can only do things one at a time, okay? Unless we develop it further, okay? But we can develop it further. Empathy is like a skill that can be improved. What practice makes perfect. 
We understand and understand and understand. The more we understand, the more we put ourselves into a situation that we can understand, the better our empathy will be. The more people we meet that are not like us, the more empathetic we can be. Okay? Empathy is developed. It is developed through immaturity. It is developed through experience. It is developed through education. It is developed through our culture. All right, all those things contribute to developing our empathy. And however, it can also be blunted, it can be narrowed, it can be shaped, okay? It can be directed towards us against them, where in actuality there is no us against them, it's just us, okay? Good, good with this, questions? All right, so how do we cultivate the muscular empathy in ourselves? I asked you to write at the beginning of this class, I asked you to write three things that defined you, okay? Take a look at those three things that define you, okay? Now tell me this, how many people in this room know those things of you? How many of the people in this room know those three things? No one, huh? Do you know? How many people? Does anybody know those three things that make you, you? Okay, does anybody? I think if, if you spend more time with that person, you will know. Okay, how, many, how often do these people look together? Dr. Twice Worsing? A week. Twice a week, for how long? Two hours, roughly each time, so four hours. So four hours a week with the same people all the time. I think that's a lot of time. <laughs> that's a lot of time. Okay. But I see people, you know, are we sitting together in groups of people, of people that are similar to us? Or are we just kind of mixed up? Do we mix it up or do we stay together? Do we stay with our people or do we be adventurous and move around and mix it up? In our okay. Yes. Okay. 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 This is a place where you can get in a group, do a group project and have the representation of four corners of the world at this place. This is a special place for that. All right. So you share those things, share those things. Who are you? Those things that define you share those things with other people and they will share their things with you. Okay. I put teacher, artist, student. Okay. Well, obviously everyone knows I'm a teacher. I'm standing here, but nobody knows I'm an artist. There's a couple of people on this campus that knows I'm an artist, but I don't really share that too much because that's separate from my work here. Okay. And student, I'm a student because I'm always learning. I'm always wanted to do new things. I always want to experience new things. But, so whatever your three things are, make sure that people around you know those three things. Because if you define yourself that way, don't you want them to define you as well? Okay? So you consider the welfare of others. Consider the people that you are around you. Consider the people that are in this room. Consider what they're going through. Put yourself in their shoes, but you gotta leave yourself behind, okay? Appreciate the things that others think are special. Okay? What does that mean? What that means is this. If someone says, oh, you got to listen to this CD. This is one of my favorite CDs. This is one of my favorite artists. You take it and you listen to it. It doesn't mean you have to like it. But if that person thinks it's special, I want to hear it. Okay? Because the great things that they think of, or they, they believe in, I want it to become part of me. Okay, my friend was saying, read this book. It's a great book. I read the book. And guess what? Reading that book makes me a better person. It increases who I am. It improves who I am. I got to take in anything to everybody. Watch this movie. Read this book. Listen to this music. You know, check out this magazine. These are the things that are surrounding me. These are the things that I think are special. I want to absorb those things. And I want to, those things are going to augment make my life better, make me understand that person a little bit more, okay? If I understand that person a little bit more, then we have a little bit of a connection. If we have a little bit of connection, we can have a conversation. And we have a conversation that will lead to other things. Okay, Paulo Freire, a philosopher in Brazil, educational philosopher in Brazil, what he did is he went into the, the favelas, the poor areas of uh, 
upper Brazil, and he got together the poor people and he taught them how to read. And the more that he taught them to read, the more they got together, the more they talked about their the readings, and the more they talked about their experience, and the more they talked, the more they understood. So their level of education and understanding rose up higher and higher and higher to the point where they understood what he calls praxis. Praxis is an understanding of yourself in the world, your position in the world, to understand how the world works and what, you, what your position in the world is. And even further on the line, the more you learn, is to understand that you can transform the world. In little bits and pieces, you can transform the world. In what you do. Okay, maybe something you say or do, you're not gonna know. You're not gonna know anything. You might say something or do something that's gonna resonate with another person. You might not think it's important at the time, but it might be very special to that other person. So share those things that you have, those things that you think are special, and take in those things that other people think are special. It improves your life, it increases what you do. Okay, explore culture from other viewpoints. Change the situation. So you wanna read different books? You wanna watch different kind of movies? Music, go to a restaurant. If you go to another, another country, go to the local restaurant. Go to, don't go to McDonald's. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Dr. Warzy was telling a story about someone having pizza in France. Tell them the story. Want to hear it? Yeah. In another life, I was in Paris, France, France. We went to the Louvre Museum, and they have built an underground food food court, sort of, and boutiques and all this. It's very weird because the museum is really old, and then you have this modern, you know, piece of architecture. Yeah. Um, and I was having dinner, I had French cuisine, of course, you're in France. It doesn't get better than that, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm there having lunch and I hear this really loud, old American couple. Uh, the man was in the 70s and the woman was in his late 60s. And they were both complaining about the food. And the man was saying, pizza ain't got much to it. Pizza ain't got much to it. I said, wrong country. Pizza? Go to Italy if you want to enjoy pizza. <laughs> this is France. France is not known for its pizza. Can you be a little bit more adventurous and say, let me try something French. I flew in all the way from the United States, you know, let in in France. And that, I think, relates to what Professor Monaghan has been trying to tell you. You know, change your situations. Listen to another music, who cares? I travel all over the world, and I buy, like, Polish music, Brazilian music. I don't understand the words. <laughs> but I try to enjoy the music. Right? No and when I travel to other countries and so places, I want to experience what it's like to be in that country. I want to eat the food. I want to listen to the music. I want to know who the, the, the authors are and so forth and so on. It's because you're, you're, you're adding it to who you are. And the more you add, the more you'll understand. The more you understand, the higher empathy you will have. Okay? So you see, you see through the eyes and ears of all the people around you. Professor Mona, can yes. you tell them about your own experience in the Dominican Republic? You didn't want to be in that situation. Ah, okay, yeah. When I first, when I first moved to the Dominican, uh, Santo Domingo, uh, they put me in a, a building, apartment building, with uh, all these other American teachers. Now, the American teachers, they moved around in like, a, like a big amoeba. They were all connected, and they all moved together, and they were... Uh, oh, we don't have to learn Spanish because Kim is with us and she knows Spanish, so we don't have to bother with it. And I found it very rude and annoying, and I really wanted to learn what it's like to be in that country and to experience uh, life there. So I had to go and I went to uh, complain to my headmaster and said, please, 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 can I move out of that place? I can't stand it. And yeah, they, they allowed me to move, so I moved out into the neighborhood and uh, I experienced Dominican or the way it's supposed to be. Eating the food, talking to the people. I made friends with the local people. I didn't have to hang out with all the American people and go to Pizza Hut. I didn't want to do that stuff. I wanted to experience the culture, the cuisine, the music, the beaches and so forth of that place that I was in. It's just, that's, that's just kind of who I like to do, what, what I like to do, who I am. Okay, so. Here are some different views. I mean, some are fiction, some are 
nonfiction, some are science fiction. These are some books and movies and te television shows that show uh, an em empathetic viewpoint. Uh, Black Like Me was a, a true story of a man, uh, John Howard Griffin, who took pills and used a sun lamp and became, he was a white man who became a black man in the South during the 1960s. And it was a shocking book because he didn't have any idea what was going to happen, but everyone thought he was a black guy. Uh, and he experienced that culture and wrote a book about it. So what he did is he transformed himself. He took himself away from, out of his shoes and put himself in the shoes of a black person. And the book is fascinating, fascinating book. Uh, American History X is a, a film, some of you might have saw, of a neo-Nazi who committed horrible crimes. He went to prison for it, but in prison, he befriended some of the uh, black uh, inmates. And he started to understand that, yeah, they're just regular people too. So he kind of denounced uh, his neo-Nazism and all that. And you know, it's, it's kind of a harsh movie to watch, but it also is, involves empathy. Dances with Wolves, a soldier from the, uh, it can, what is it, the army, uh, goes out and ends up uh, mingling with the Native Americans and learning that they weren't horrible, savage people that did horrible things. They were actual natural people who did beautiful things. He became part of their tribe. Same story with Avatar. He was supposed to be a Marine who infiltrated the enemy. He became one of them and turned on, became, they call that going native. Enemy Mine, I think, is the greatest of them all. Enemy Mine is a science fiction movie, and I think all of the levels of empathy, everything we talked about today, is all in that movie. You go through the whole range of emotion. It's a great movie. To Kill a Mockingbird is considered one of the most empathetic books ever written. The Hunger Games, something new. Uh, some of you might have seen that, that just came out recently. That's a movie that expresses empathy. You see through their eyes, their survival. Uh, 30 Days was a television show where Morgan Spurlock is the same guy that did Supersize Me. What he did is, what is it like to be in prison for 30 days? What is it like to be a Muslim for 30 days? What is it like to be poor for 30 days, live on minimum wage? What is it like to live off the grid for 30 days? He did all of these things for 30 days at a time and filmed it. And that is true transformational empathy, where he is putting himself in these situations. So these are some, uh, some things that you can look at and that will have this empathic view that might help you. Yes? Um, is there a relationship between empathy and validity? Empathy and what? No, I, wouldn't, I would say no. That I don't, I've never read anything that says there's a relationship between empathy and heredity. Uh, there's a book that came out in 1994. It was called The, um, the History and Geography of the Human Gene. It was a big old fat book. But what the basic book said is, we have more in common with each other than we do with our particular race, okay? We have more in common with each other than we do with our, you know, ethnicities. So across the board, okay? Um, another question. If a married, like a married couple, like um, a husband and a wife, if a wife cheats on her husband, like will, will the man feel empathy? Like, would he feel? Oh, that's a, that's a situation you're gonna have to ask them. Uh, <laughs> All those private and personal situations are their own particular situations. I don't think I could uh, give a broad example for something as specific as that. It all depends on the situation. Yes? When you say you um, can form empathy, like, you know, um, try to turn bad people into good people, how do you suppose we do that? You can what? When you said, oh, we can transform empathy to turn bad people into good people, how do you suppose we do that? Well, that's what we said. We, we, we open up our hearts, we open up ourselves to these people, we share what we have. We show them what we think are special. Like, if I wanted to increase empathy in somebody that doesn't have any, for example, if I wanted to increase uh, the empathy of one of our uh, politicians who aren't really doing very well as far as serving our, their nation, I would like beam, beam them into a small village in the Philippines or something for a month. <laughs> you put them in a situation that they're completely foreign, and then you learn that situation. That situation becomes part of them. So you want to take the people, you want to take them out of their comfort zone. Sometimes you have to take them out of your comfort zone and put them in a, in a strange new place. Okay, and then that becomes their play, and that becomes familiar to them. So having uh, transformational empathy is 
going out and learning, becoming familiar with things that are strange and foreign to you. That's why he calls it a muscular empathy, because it takes effort. It takes motivation. It takes a leap of faith to, to try something out that you've never tried before. Okay? Oh, yes. Well, they showed, they see that uh, uh, monkeys have empathy. And certain animals, yeah, certain animals, mostly mammals, were showing empathetic uh, whales do. And uh, they showed uh, uh, the chimpanzees. And one, one time, one of the chimpanzees got the rope caught around his neck. All right? And the big chimpanzee came over. Instead of just yanking on him, which would have broke his neck, lifted him up, unwrapped the cord, put him down. You have to have empathy. You have to even experience a feeling in order to do that. Something as complex as that. So, do you think uh, humans develop the same empathy as the animal? I think that higher higher uh, primates have empathy. I think a lot of animals is going to show that a lot of animals have empathy. Again, it's a connection. It's the mirror neurons that we connect each other. We can read each other's emotions. Okay, you think that do don't you? Does if you have a dog or a cat, do you think that they understand that when you're sick? Yeah. Oh yeah, they do. They because that they're using their mirror neurons. Okay. Any questions? Any further questions? I just want to know how the mother, like the question that I asked you before, how can a mother know if she has two kids? How I know if one has empathy in the other one? How the the two will be different? Okay, so so you're thinking like a one kid that might be tended towards bad and good. You got to give as much love to both of them, and 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 they are who they are, and you got to take what they are and try to make it better. It's not that one's not going to have it. There are people that don't have mirror neurons, okay? People with autism spectrum disorder, they don't have mirror neurons, and that's their issue where they can't read other people's feelings. So someone with autism comes in a room and everyone's yawning, they're not going to yawn. If you come into a room, everyone's yawning, you're probably going to yawn. If everyone's smiling, you're going to smile. If everyone's laughing, you're going to laugh. If everyone's sad, you're going to be sad because you're reading their emotions. Um, okay? In the video, we showed that um, each person, like, you know, from your own nation, you have empathy for, like, if I'm. The situational people, empathy, yes, it's all situational. If, if anyone, everybody, have empathy, like, we are on the same. Same page. Do you think the word would make sense? Like yes, I, I mean that would be the, that would be called you know a great a great thing. It would be a great thing if we all finally got together and we didn't have these you know um, big gaps between the rich and the poor and everyone was able to sustain themselves. Uh, I think we'd have uh, more progress. More progress. Can I ask you a question? Sure. You mentioned before in the beginning the whole thing about how empathy okay. is a skill that can be developed. I actually feel like I disagree with you on that. Some people I know, like for example, I'm a musician. I picked it up real quickly because it's just something that was just warm. Like, I know people who've been practicing for about nine years, and they can't even get to the level that I got up to in three. So my point is, some people I feel like some people have certain skills and others don't. No matter how much they try to improve the skill, they won't. And it's been, there's other people I know. Like I'm empathetic with a lot of people. I can. It's just something that. I just feel like I, I can do. I just feel like it's something that you know, not just mm -hmm. something you felt. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, empathy, is, I said, is like a skill. It's not a skill. Okay. It's an affective response. It's built into us. So it's, you know, it works. But like I said, it can be improved. But it takes a lot. It will take a lot for some people. It will take a lot for some people who are afraid, who want to stay in their comfort zone. And I, I mean, I can get into that. But that would be a whole other lecture. Uh, some people get, some people turn off to things. For example, uh, I don't do well in music, so I, I don't like to, and I failed at playing music. My brain actually hardwires me to avoid that unpleasant situation. So some, you know, most of us have that same situation where our brains will, will redirect us away from the unpleasant things and toward the pleasant things. So to have empathy is, is kind of beyond that. Okay, we can augment it. it. It's been proven. I mean, I did it in my dissertation. I increased the level of empathy in my students by showing them an educational program, and significantly it worked. So it can be augmented. It's been shown in many, many, many studies. Anyone else? Anything else?
Thank, thank you. Very much. All right. You guys are great. Dr. Monahan. Thank you, thank you.